Hochschule. Recorded live. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to this week's edition of the University of Eucadia Talk Show, which is on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, this Wednesday, the 15th of June, uh, 2011. Apologies from Terry Lynn. Uh, Terry tonight is unfortunately uh, got electrical storms. And so our thoughts and prayers go out to her because, as I'm sure a number of you know, the weather has uh, not been good in many parts of uh, the United States. So her apologies tonight, but I'm sure she'll be back on uh, next Wednesday as the host. And so thank you all. Uh, tonight I am balancing both. I am uh, speaking about some of the updates this week and some exciting information that I want to share with you all. And I'm also going to be trying, at least, to take your calls and your questions. So as always, let me just start by, by covering a couple of things. This is a, a call that's recorded on TalkShoe. I welcome all those who are listening to it live and all those that will be listening later to the download. Uh, the information I provide to you uh, is just that. It's information. It's not advice and, and nothing I say to you is meant to be direct legal advice uh, at all. You can listen to this call via TalkShoe or you can download this call and any of the other calls via universityofucadia.info. That's university.ucadia.info. So last week uh, we covered a number of things. We covered it under the topic that um, everything is going to be okay uh, long as we um, focus on what we're doing and we focus on how we're behaving. And that topic, while it was a fairly broad topic, was, was raised because one of the things, one of the themes that I, I get from many of you is the ongoing concern and very real concern that rather than things getting better, in many respects, it appears to be getting worse. For example, the... Patriot Act, uh, one of the most uh, horrendous acts, and by the Constitution, a completely illegal statute was renewed by Obama, and uh, there wasn't even a peep out of the press. And of course, within that, there were additions where the FBI has reached a point where they have powers to virtually come, arrest, seize, and detain without any of the judicial requirements in the past. Now, I'm not clear on that yet. This is only what I've been told, and I'm, I'm yet to confirm that. But it wouldn't surprise me. And it is an example where, in many respects, things appear to be getting worse. So last week we spoke about, and we spoke because of the growing concern of uh, Elenin and what they're not telling us about changes, major changes in our solar system, and so that was another area of concern. And of course, one of the biggest concerns we all face is the uncertainty of the economy and what's happening there because the rumours abound. Some talk about the restoration of quote-unquote lawful money, which really is money owned by the families. Some talk about the dollar being collapsed at any time. There's all these rumours swirling around and, and the internet and the chat rooms and the blogs are full of them. Again, this goes to the heart of, of concern. So I covered that last week. But having said that, there are two things that I, I think we missed. One is it's, it's fine to talk about everything is going to be okay. But as all of you, I'm sure, find a common theme, and that is you come to these calls, you come to Eucadia. The whole reason you probably searched this out to, in, the, in the first place was that you were looking for practical, pragmatic, immediate help to immediate issues. Sure, a, num a number of you, and I'm very grateful that a number of you are looking to the longer term, but the real thing that people are looking for is hard facts, real action, real remedy. 
So I'm actually going to give that to you tonight. I'm going to cover a couple of things tonight where I am actually going to give very tangible, very real suggestions, ideas, facts around remedy. It may not appear to be the kind of remedy you expected, but it certainly is going to be remedy that directly addresses the issues and concerns you have and the very real concerns about the future you have. And the topic tonight for that is virtue conquers peril. Very simple, very straight, but virtue conquers peril. We've spoken about fear, we've spoken about the need to overcome fear, how fear is a weapon, how they manipulate us, how much of what we see in the press, the reason there's so much change is that they want so much change to be published. Because if we remain unbalanced, if we remain in stress, then of course that is one of the key ways that they keep us off balance. So I'm going to talk about that. Virtue conquers peril. Well, before I get too much further, let's just talk about how tonight will be structured. So I'm going to talk for the next, for the, for the next uh, hour, just under an hour. And then uh, what I always ask and I always like to do is take your questions. And no question is out of bounds. You can ask anything you like. What I do ask when you ask questions is two things. If you want to speak, and I hope you, you will, I ask that you press star 8 at the end of this hour so that I can see that you're in a queue and then I'll be answering those. That's star 8, I believe, is the uh, control. If I've got that wrong, I just ask someone to punch into the talk. The other is I ask if you don't want to speak and you want to ask a question at the end of the hour, please, what I ask you to do is type in the word question in capitals so I can see it and then your question and I will aim to answer all the questions and certainly I ask and, and will be aimed to, to answer all the um, talk, anyone who wants to speak for their questions. So let me start by just a story on this issue of, of vir virtue conquers peril. And you'll see when I get into it, uh, some of the power of what we uh, are going to talk about, particularly when we understand the nature of these things and the nature of what is virtue. We might think we know what virtue is, but I think you'll be surprised. We may even think we know what peril is or fear is. And again, I hope and trust that you will be surprised by the true nature of these things. And in honor of the Egyptian understanding of words, an ancient mystery of the Egyptians, that remind us that every word is magic, all words are magic, language is magic, that to know a thing, to name a thing for what it is, is to take its power. In other words, to actually know the origin of a word, its first use, its first meaning, is to know its first magic, its first power. And when we know that, we are able in many cases to capture that in our mind and to take that power and to reclaim power in ourselves. So I said I'd start with a story and, and my story today is one when I was about eight years old and the family I grew up with was, uh, was full of priests and nuns, doctors, lawyers. And so when you're brought up in that sort of environment, you take for granted what you see. And I took for granted what I saw with priests and nuns. And I had a series of great uncles. And those great uncles, by the time I was born, were at a very advanced age. Most of them at that stage were in their 80s and passed away in their 90s. And one of them was a, a fellow by the name of, uh, I remember as Uncle Will, Father William O'Collins. And he was, a, he was a Jesuit. Anyway, I remember uh, that when he died, uh, there was a great and grand ceremony and all the bishops of Australia came and all the senior Jesuits arrived and it was a huge pomp and circumstance uh, and he was given a great send-off. But when I went to school, these weren't the things that kids at school were interested in. Kids didn't talk about philosophy. <laughs> they certainly didn't talk about religion. 
the school I went to, the things that were cool were comics and magazines and games and toys and TV shows. Certainly religion and talking about the machinations of society, these were not things that the kids were interested in at all. So when I would go to school and I would hear the other kids talking about the games they had or what they were doing or the sport they were playing, as a kid I felt less to them. And with an imagination I felt that sometimes to fit in, the way to fit in was to say things and do things to be liked. And if you want to cut that down to what I'm saying, I learnt and, and started to not tell the truth. So as a child, not telling the truth, I said to my classmates that Uncle Will didn't die of old age, but in fact Uncle Will died from being murdered in a knife attack <laughs> in Richmond, <laughs> a suburb of Melbourne. And I laugh about it now because, I mean, it was a terrible lie. And it was a terrible lie that had terrible consequences because the headmaster of the school called my mother and, and actually sent me home and uh, actually wrote a note to my mother with the deepest of condolences because I had told the class that my great-uncle Will had been murdered in Richmond, of course, which was a complete lie. So I learned at an early age uh, this desire and feeling that I wanted to fit in. And so I learned the nature of this thing called ego, this thing that makes us feel inadequate, this thing that makes us want more, this thing that tells us we're in danger, this thing that tells us we're less, this thing that looks at our heating bill and tells us we're in trouble even though we have heat or our home and tells us that we're less even though we have a home. And over time, you know, my ego has grown. But what's taken a long, long time to look at these things and to see those parts of myself that are less and to understand what's going on. And I'd hoped that cognitive law would be up and running to be able to show you tonight. And it's not up yet. It will be up soon, but tonight I'm going to share some of this with you under the theme that virtue conquers peril. There was one person in my life, and I didn't really appreciate him or what he represented for most of my life until the last few years of his life. And he was a living example of someone without ego. He was a doctor. He had done well. He had provided for his family. But he felt compelled in his life to live in a life of virtue and to tell the truth. He had no need to embellish his life. He had no need to embellish who or what he was. He was who he was. And as a child, trying to fit in and trying to be liked and be loved, I was terribly frustrated with him for, for him being this way. Because what I saw on television and what I saw with others was that's not how you got ahead. You didn't get ahead by being virtuous. You got ahead by being whatever it took by allowing ego to be. Free market, free capitalism, capitalism, choice, this is all about doing whatever it takes to get ahead. And that's what's promoted. So I saw that and I was frustrated, even though I was blessed to live in such an amazing world as to be uh, taught in a good school, to live in a fine home, to have food on the table and to be safe. But the final thing this man taught me is that despite of the fact that many times in his life he was taken advantage of, despite the fact that he had been disappointed many times by people around him, not the least myself, in spite of dying very painfully from cancer, even though I missed his death, 